Tonight we're going to pick up again with our study in Zechariah. And uh, I got this fly here that's bothering me, but I have to get some fly swatters here, I guess. Zechariah, the messianic hope, the hope that we have of a returning Savior. It's really written in, to just refresh our memories a little bit, it's written in context of the nation of Israel. Uh, the Jews, although they don't realize it, they have a messianic hope. They have a Messiah that's coming. Their Messiah has already been here. But as a nation, they have rejected him, yet many have, uh, many have accepted him. But we're looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. And Zechariah is about that. Now, before we get into the actual uh, message of Zechariah, I want to talk a little bit tonight because what we're going to read tonight is like a doctrinal portion of Zechariah's. Uh, after this, starting, uh, well, the week after next, we'll be talking about the prophetic parts, which is the end of Zechariah. But these two chapters, chapters 7 and 8, have to deal with a, like a doctrinal thing. But the, the focus is the land, okay? Now, we all know that over there in Israel is a city named Jerusalem. It's one of the oldest cities in the world, and the Bible tells us it will be a cup of trembling. Uh, these numbers, just some statistics, it's about 78 square miles, and these uh, <laughs> numbers are a couple years old, probably a little bit more than that. Almost 700,000 population of the city of Jerusalem, uh, almost 500,000 Jews, uh, just a little over 200,000 Muslims, 14,000 Christians, Arab Christians, of those Christians, uh, 12,000 of them are Arab, and then there's non-Arab Christians, of course, and there's unclassified. These are the people that make up the city of Jerusalem today. Uh, and there's kind of a map, I, again, just, just so you get an idea. The land. God says a lot about the land. The land of Israel. What are they fighting over today? They're fighting over the land. Uh, here's a little close-up of the map. That's the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and there's a little close-up, and this doesn't have a little pointer on it, but uh, you can see where, where they, it says the old city, well, you can't see it, but <laughs> about halfway up, it, there's the old city and the Temple Mount and so forth. That's really the hottest piece of property on the face of the earth. And uh, Zechariah, and when we get into the prophetic parts, we're going to see a lot about Jerusalem. We're going to hear a lot about Jerusalem and about the land. It's all about the land. That what's going on today is about the land. Uh, one, one place I want you to turn with me before we look in Zechariah. You know the Jews were, uh, they were, they went into 70 years captivity because of their idolatry. Do you know why he picked 70 years? Well 70 is a number of like completion, you know, perfection and all that. <laughs> but do you realize that when God gave the law to Moses, he told the Jews that every seventh year was to be a Sabbath year. And what that meant was that they were an agricultural society, an agrarian society, so they would, they would farm, but every seven years they were supposed to leave their farmlands just to rest. It's called a Sabbath year. They didn't do that. In 70 years, it was like 490 years from Saul to the captivity or thereabouts. So it was like those 70 years of of captivity were actually 70 Sabbaths. Turn with me to Leviticus. I just want you to read something with me. And, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to Zechariah. Le uh, Leviticus chapter 26. That's the fourth book. I'm sorry, third book. Leviticus chapter 26. I want to start, I'm going to be reading from verse 40, just to uh, see here. He was talking about if the people of Israel sinned and, and what he would, the plagues he would send on them and so forth. And he says in verse, um, verse 40 of Leviticus chapter 26, If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, 
If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they, uh, they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember, and I will remember the land, the land. The land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbath. God made sure that the land was going to enjoy its rest by taking Israel and putting them into captivity. He says the land will enjoy her Sabbath while she lies desolate without them, and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they despise my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Thank the Lord. Even though he might put us in a place, uh, he set us aside a place of, of correction, he's not going to cast us away. He's not going to throw us away. He says, I'm not going to cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. God is saying here in Leviticus that the Jews will inhabit their land. What's going on today, we're talking about, you know, the Arabs and talking about Iran building nuclear weapons and so forth. Listen, nobody is going to drive Israel out of that land. Nobody's going to talk them into leaving it. Because that's the land that God had promised to them. And even though they may have been scattered for, you know, over almost 2,000 years, God still returned them to the land. And we're going to see that a little bit when we turn back to Zechariah. We're going to see the promises that God made. We're going to begin tonight in Zechariah chapter 7. And it says this. Okay. Let me remember my... Oh, there's some pictures of Jerusalem. I'm sorry. You see the dome on the rock there? You see the new city in the background. But of course in the foreground it's the old city with the dome on the rock. That's where the temple will be. Another view from an, another uh, vantage point. Okay. Zechariah chapter 7 and 8. A question of religious ritual. Now the Jews, they had things that they did that God told them to do throughout their, in their religion. Offerings and sacrifices and so forth. We're going to see in chapter 7, there's a question. And we'll look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 7, and let's read. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius, that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Chislu. When they had sent unto the house of God, shoot, I'm not going to try to pronounce these, uh, and their men to pray before the Lord, and to speak before the priests which were in the house of the Lord of hosts, and to the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done there so many years. Now, what it's talking about, you know, when God first gave the law to Israel, he gave them feast days and fast days. There were days that they would fast and days that they could feast. But when the Jews were taken into captivity, and this was a number of years now after they had returned, the, uh, the temple was, was almost completed, the city was in the process of being restored, and they had a question. It was a legitimate question. When they were in captivity, they remembered the day that, is, that Ju uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. And on that day, in the fifth month, they would fast. That's you know, the, the Jews in Babylon. They would fast to remember that, that horrible day that, that uh, their city was destroyed. So now that they're back in the city, and the temple is being built again, they had a, a legitimate question. Should we still fast on that day. Should we still commemorate? This is a doctrinal section now, okay, before we get into the prophetic. They ask the question. And the question, really, uh, God answers the question in about, like three answers. He gave three answers, okay? Now, answer number one in verse four. It says this, verse four through seven. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land, and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? When you were fasting, was it, was it 
to get to know me better or were you just sad? What, what was the purpose of your fasting? And when you did eat and when you did drink, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should you not hear the words which the Lord has cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south and the plain? He's saying, when you fasted those 70 years and those months, did you do it because you were truly sorry? Was it really unto me? Or did you turn it into a ritual? Well, it's the day that we're remembering the destruction, so we'll, we'll have a fast day. And it really applies to every one of us that do service to the Lord and do worship God. When we worship, when we sing, when we, when we fast and pray, is it unto the Lord or is it just, you know, do we think it's some kind of a magic act? Uh, he said here, do you remember, he, re, he, he referred to the former days when Israel was doing well. He said, do you remember what the prophet said about fasting back then? And again, if you put your finger there in, in, uh, in there and turn back to Isaiah chapter 58. It's the fasting chapter. And uh, I'll find it. Isaiah chapter 58. Listen to what Isaiah said. Now, when Isaiah said this, when God gave this to say to Isaiah, Israel was doing well. They were prospering, just like Zechariah said. You remember in the days when you prospered and everything went well. Listen to what Isaiah says. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. They, they, they were doing all the religious things, but they weren't right with God. They weren't living right. They weren't doing things that were right. They, it says, wherefore have we fasted, say they. And now see, it's not they were saying, God, you know, we're fasting, but we're not getting any answers to our prayer. Listen to what the Lord says. Wherefore have we not afflicted our soul? And thou takest no knowledge? God, don't you see what we're doing? Don't you see this fasting that we're doing and this affliction that we're putting ourselves through? Behold, in the day of your fast, listen, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. I mean, I, one time I should, I should have looked up that video. Remember I showed the video about the fast? I'll have to dig that up again. When the guy decided he was going to fast, so, you know, as soon as midnight, I mean, he ate like, you know, three turkeys, and then midnight rolled around, he says, I'm fasting. And he went to work and he says, oh, and he was like, oh. <laughs> you know? And as soon as midnight came around again, he was like, he started, you know, what, this, you know, our, the stuff we do religiously, why do we do it? Listen to what he says. He says, you know, when you fast, this is like, you know, he's like, you go to Kennywood and don't eat the, the you know, potato fries, right? Okay. He says, he, he says in verse 4, Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with a fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Do you think that just because we, we keep ourselves from eating for a day or for a couple hours, if we're not allowing that fast to change us on the inside, do you think God really, he's just, you know, he's really impressed with the fact that we can't eat for a day or a couple days? He says, is it such a fast that I have chosen? Now here it is. Here's, here's, here's the true fasting. See, if the motive is right, then the ritual will be all right. He says, A day for a man to afflict his soul, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. We ought to be fasting for people to be delivered. Crying, pe crying out for people that need healed and delivered instead of just trying to, you know, make brownie points with God. He says, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked and co that you cover him and that you hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be then revealed. 
Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness is the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. See, it's not the, just the, the thing of fasting. It's why you're doing it. Religion, it's not just the stuff we do in church. It's why we're doing it. So when, the, when they ask the question, should we fast in the fifth month, in the tenth month? Zechariah answered, well, why are you doing it? If your motive is right, if your fast is unto him, then the ritual was right. If the reason is right, the ritual will be right. If the heart is right, then it's not in what we do, it's why we do it, okay? Back to Zechariah. Now that was the first answer, okay? The second answer comes in verses 8 through 10. And he says this. <laughs> and the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy. This really reflects back on what Isaiah said. And compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to listen and pulled away the shoulder. You ever have somebody do that to you? They kind of pull away from you. That God put his hand on their shoulder and they pulled it away and they stopped their ears that they should not hear. You see, if the, fast, if the heart is right, the fast will be right. If the heart is wrong, the fast is wrong. It all depends on what's on the inside. Do we execute true judgment? Do we show mercy and compassion? Do we refrain from oppressing people? And do we stop, keep from imagining evil against our brother? See, that's something that's really easy for us to fall into when we feel, when we got people coming against us and people doing things, man, the first thing we want to do is just imagine all the things we'd like to see happen to them. But if that's our motivation, if that's, you know, uh, if there's a story, we just read it today in our devotions, a story in the book of Acts where those 40 guys said they were going to fast until they killed Paul. Remember that story? They wanted to kill the Apostle Paul. So they took an oath and they said, we're not going to eat until we until we kill Paul. That's the wrong, that's the wrong reason to fast, <laughs> to kill somebody. Okay, and they never did get a chance to do it anyhow. Let's read a little bit more here in this chapter, and then we'll go to the next chapter. It says this. They made their hearts, look at verse 12. They made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. They didn't want to listen to God. They were doing, they were going through the ritual. They were doing the religious stuff, but they didn't want to listen to God. When we fast and pray, it's so we could hear God. But what they were doing, God was trying to speak to them, and they weren't listening. You know, Jesus told a story about fasting. Not a story, but he said, you know, when you fast, what are you supposed to do? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> you know, go, go fast, fix your hair, wipe your face, and go about your business. But, you know, some folks, when they're fasting, they're sure to tell everybody, well, I'm fasting today. <laughs> you offer them a donut, and instead of saying just, no thanks, they'll say, I'm fasting. Okay. Uh, <laughs> reading a little bit more. Verse 13. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear. See, when we play the religious games with God, it's dangerous. Because when God speaks to us and we don't listen, you know what? When we start speaking to him, he's not going to listen. He's not going to listen. If we're not going to listen to him, we're not going to listen to what he tells us anyhow. When we cry to him, he won't listen. Until we have a heart that's broken. Until we have a heart that's repentant. That we could cry out 
and then he'll hear, and then he'll speak to us, and then we'll listen. You know, God can break your heart enough that you'll listen to what he has to say. How many know what I'm talking about? Sometimes God got to do a whole lot of breaking before we start listening. I've been there. Therefore it's come to pass as he cried that they would not hear in verse 13. So they cried and I would not hear, says the Lord. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. He spoke. They spoke to him and he didn't listen. He spoke to them and they didn't listen and he wouldn't listen to them. He tried to gather them together and they would not so they were scattered. He didn't, the people didn't treat the land with, with respect, so God made the land desolate for 70 years. You know, we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. We're seeing it in our nation right now. We're reaping what we've sown as a people. We've, we've cast God out of our schools and everything else in public life, and, and who do we have to vote for this year? Okay, we're getting what we really, and maybe not you or I personally, ask for, but as a people, you get what you ask for. You get what you ask for, okay? Now, there's another answer to that question, and that's in chapter 8. I'm not going to be too long tonight. Chapter 8 deals with God's purpose concerning Jerusalem. The land, the land that's still there, the Temple Mount, Israel, that land that God promised to Abraham and his, Abraham and his offspring. He says, again the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with a great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Fury. Anger. Come on, have you ever been furious? For somebody, no, I hope not all the time. <laughs> There's times when fury is a good thing. You know, I'm going to be furious, jealous for my wife. Don't mess with my wife. Okay, you know. I'm furious, jealous for my church. Don't mess with my church. Don't mess with my people. It gets me mad. It makes me raise my voice. God is furious, jealous for Zion, for Israel. Don't you think that he's not getting angry at, at, at the attempts they want to drive Israel into the sea? God is angry. Don't you think he'll get angry at any nation that turns their back on Israel and becomes an enemy of Israel? Because he's furiously jealous for Zion. He says, thus says the Lord, in verse 3, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. You know, this was spoken thousands of years ago. And he's speaking this to a people who are rebuilding the city from destruction, but this is going way beyond even where we are right now. I said, Zechariah, when we get into the prophetic passages after uh, chapter 9 and onward, we're going to see things that, that God shows Zechariah that, that have not happened yet. It's still coming to happen. Jerusalem will be called a city of truth. People won't call it that today. It says later on, Jerusalem's going to be a cup of trembling to the world. And that's really what it's becoming. He said, it will be a city of truth. Look at verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Don't have to worry about bombers. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, says the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. This hasn't happened yet. 
He brought his people back from Babylonian captivity. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the city. But that city was always under the yoke of some Gentile nation. In 1967, the armies of Israel marched into Jerusalem and recaptured it. And don't you know, everybody wants them to give it back. They'll never give it back. They'll never give it back. Because they're God's people. They might not even realize it. They're God's people and God is their God. And when Christ returns, he's not going back anywhere. He's coming back to Jerusalem. It says, in verse 9, we're just going to read. Thus says the Lord of hosts to Israel. I'm forgetting to change my... I'm sorry. He says... Verse 10, For before the, these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I said, All men, every one against his neighbor. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. For the sea shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Israel has been like the fruit basket of the world since the Jews have taken over. It was scorched earth before that. But when God's people got back, He began to bless the land. He began to show them how to make things grow again. How to make it fruitful again. He says, their seed shall be prosperous. Look at verse 13. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Saying, listen, God promised that through Abraham there would come a great blessing. You know, it's Christ the Messiah. And when he comes back, he'll be a great blessing. Now somebody's going to say, wait a minute, how does this answer that question about fasting? Remember that we started out, you know, should we observe the fast? Here's what God's saying. I'm going to do this whether you fast or not. I'm going to do this whether you observe. This is what I have promised. This is what I'm going to accomplish. There's going to be a remnant in Israel that's going to be faithful, that's going to love God, and I'm going to establish them in their land. I'm going to do everything I've promised. He says, Verse 15. Oh, verse 14. For thus says the Lord of hosts, As I thought to punish you, when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I repented not, so again, have I thought in these days to do well with Jerusalem and to the house of Judah? Fear ye not. Yes, that's right. I sent you into captivity for 70 years. Yes, that's right. There, there has been... Uh, in the last 2,000 years, yes, Israel has been set aside and the body of Christ has been the church made of Jew and Gentile going forth and being the witnesses in all the world and Israel has kind of been set aside. But he has not forsaken them and will, not, will never forsake them. But keep all the promises he made to them. These things are what you shall do. In verse 16. Speak every man the truth to his neighbor execute judgment of truth and peace in your gates, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts. We read that before, didn't we? And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, in verse 18, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore love the truth. He says, I'm going to take all your fast days, and I'm going to turn them to feast days. I'm going to take your mourning and I'm going to turn it to gladness. I'm going to give you beauty for ashes, he says.
He says, thus says the Lord of hosts in verse 20, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people, and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go. Just imagine, people all over the world are saying, Let's get to, we got to get to Jerusalem. We've got to pray before Jesus. We've got to pray before the Lord. Now, now you can't drag people to church, but then... When Christ establishes his kingdom, this is the millennial kingdom. When Christ establishes his kingdom, the people on earth are going to be standing in line to praise the Lord. Not only the Jews, but he goes on and he says, in verse 22, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days it will come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, let us go with you, please take us with you to the, to the, the, the temple of your God. That's what's coming. Right now, 98% of the world wants to see Israel evaporate into thin air. But there's coming a time God made the promise that they're going to be begging, people are going to be begging Jews, please let us know who your God is. The time is coming. So I pray right now, you know, in, in this time that we're living in, we are Christ's ambassadors on this earth. I pray that people would start begging us to let them know who our God is. See, we can't take them to a temple. We don't do a temple. But we can take them to our God. Would God bless us enough that the world will look at us and say, I want what they have. I see how they live. I want what they have. Tell me about your God. See, the whole bottom line of all of this is when you fast and seek the Lord, say, God, make, make me desirable to all the people around me. Not me, personally, but you living in me. Because that's what he says, you know what, you can fast, you can pray, it doesn't matter. Because I'm going to do, my purpose concerning Jerusalem is unchanged by any ritual. I'm going to bless the remnant and God will make Israel a blessing. The fast that were the object of the original question, I haven't kept up with my presentation, will become days of joy and feasting. Beauty for ashes. Joy for tears. Gladness for mourning. Peace for despair. That's what he promised Israel and that's what he promises us too. Let's have a word of prayer.